Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar today. Please take a few minutes to um, participate in the poll that should be in front of you. And we'll allow just a couple more minutes for others to join and then get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for making time to join us today. Hopefully you've had a chance to uh, take a look at the poll and participate. Uh, so some of the survey feedback should be in front of you. My name's Keith Keeler from Crayon, and it's an honor and pleasure to moderate today's webinar. Crayon and Armor Security are excited to host a roundtable with great panel of senior leaders that are with us today. The conversation will cover viewpoints, thoughts on how events are, recent events are affecting the global economy and have forced companies to enable remote working as a requirement and a standard. We'll also cover thoughts and recommendations on how businesses and techni technical leaders are managing changes and impact to the business. So things like how are companies scaling their workforce? How are organizations maintaining security standards? And what measures are leaders taking to mitigate operational costs? So first, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And I'd like to uh, thank our panelists for making time out of their busy schedules to join us today as well. First, we'll start out with uh, some brief introductions and then go into um, some shared stories, roundtable questions, if you will, on some of the topics that I just mentioned. Then we'll save some time at the end for Q&A from the audience. So uh, as you think of questions, please feel free to uh, add them to the questions section in the, in the chat for the webinar. And then we'll wrap up with closing. And as you exit the uh, webinar this afternoon, there will be an exit survey. So please take part in the uh, exit survey. There is also a, an area for questions that maybe weren't covered or you'd like us to follow up with at a later date. 
So without further ado, I'd like to uh, start with some introductions. So uh, Glenn Orkut, could you introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Keith. Uh, Glenn Orcutt here, coming from the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area. I work for Crayon. Uh, I lead the U.S. subsidiary. Uh, we've got about a team of uh, 100 people across the nation. I'll be happy to bring in that uh, into that uh, structure more as we talk here in the next hour. Thank you, Keith. Excellent. Thank you. Michael. Hi, yeah, I'm Michael Hawkins. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Vivify Health. So we're a remote patient monitoring platform that enables hospitals to monitor their patients outside the walls of the hospital. Um, and right now we're doing quite a bit of COVID monitoring as well through this. So that's where we've seen a lot of growth right now. Absolutely. Chris. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I'm Chris Doof. I'm the Chief Security Officer here at Armor. Uh, we're a cloud security company um, uh, providing protection of workloads, uh, single pane of glass, compliance outcomes, um, and protecting uh, critical assets. Excellent. Great. Thank you, Chris. And Matt? Yeah, hi. Uh, Matt Sosman. I'm a Senior Security Architect at Microsoft. So I work with our enterprise customers and our partner community to help our uh, joint customers get secure, get compliant, and take advantage of those uh, of those solutions. And Thanks again for having me. Excellent. Thanks everyone for uh, being with us this afternoon. So, um, you know, I know that everybody is is eager to learn more about your thoughts and what you everyone is seeing in the market uh, with the recent changes. So, Glenn, maybe why don't you start us off? How um, how has COVID affected um, Crayon as an organization in the U.S. and uh, what was what's the approach been for Crayon as an organization and uh, for you individually and, and how you look at managing the subsidiary? Yeah, thanks, Keith. Uh, I'll do the best I can to address that. I mean, uh, Crayon is a global company. We're in over 42 countries. So uh, how COVID began to affect us was at different stages, as you would imagine, uh, whereas like Singapore was, you know, much uh, taking on, you know, uh, the, the the challenge much faster than us, and we were still doing our thing um, in the U.S. But you know, look, as we came into to March, that's when things really started to pick up. And uh, for for us, it was really one to understand at a company level um, what our position was and what we needed to do to ensure safety of our employees, uh, and then also how we take care of our customers and our partners. Uh, during that time. So um, we keep quickly had to mobilize, uh, got the leadership team together. We had regular, regular cadences, sometimes multiple times a day. It was more about, you know, looking at our employees on who was, um, half of our employees are remote already, so they're they're in a good, good position, but their world still did change a little bit. Um, and then the other half of our employees were centrally based out of Dallas, so it was how do we get them to a remote work um, environment, um, you know, quickly and efficiently. Uh, so it was really about a lot of communication across the leadership team, as well as getting to the individual contributors to understand what do you need to be productive at home. Um, the important thing for us, I think, as I reflect on this, is that we were in a really good position uh, at a global level and a local level where we had the setup uh, from a Microsoft Teams perspective to allow us to just leverage that platform immediately we were already using the platform um, in, in many, many ways. So it, it, it just accelerated how we interacted with employees and, and how we had to get them set up with the work at home environment. So the monitors and the devices and the, all the little, you know, things that, that help make you productive in the office, we had to make sure those things were, were available from a Jabra speaker to a headset those types of things. Um, and then, oh, by the way, where do you work at home? <laughs> it might be in the corner of a bedroom and it might be uh, at a shared table with a spouse. So it was how do we help employees adjust with that? Um, so a few things in there, is that help, helping address the question you, you asked? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I can imagine that for, um, for those who traditionally commute into the office, it can be more of an adjustment to get used yeah. to working. Um, yeah, the big thing for us on my, on my mind um, with the team was, look, there's this personal level of anxiety with COVID, right? And, and so then you have this professional um, side of it, which there's anxiety of, I'm, I'm working from home, it's different. 
or even, you know, I've worked from home, but I've got, a, I've got things going on around me that have not been here before kids, spouse, just it's different. Um, so it's how do you make sure you got a level of communication happening that says, Hey, it's okay. There's some anxiety. Uh, we're all in this together. Let's talk about it. Right. Let's at least voice some concerns. Uh, what's on your mind and you know i just need i just need to talk to somebody about about what i'm going through so it was just it was just having communication you know peer to peer um, i would conduct uh, videos on a regular basis with the team um, just kind of one to many type of video of what we're doing what we're working on what we're seeing um, you know keeping that transparency as much as possible to say hey we're all in this together now what does that mean for you and your role and for your life those are things we have to work through and, and it's okay. It's okay that that we're, we're all moving at the speed of light here and dealing with something that's uncontrollable. And hey, oh, by the way, we need to be really safe uh, during mm -hmm. this time. Uh, we need to take the appropriate precautions and, and, and make sure that's incorporated in how we operate. Absolutely. Michael, how's that experience been similar or different for you with your organization and the people that, that your team supports? Yeah, I think it for us, it actually, there's two aspects to it. Um, I think there's the aspect that I think everyone's experiencing where we're all working from home now, you know, the, the shelter in place, the stay at home. Um, from that aspect, I think one, we were, one, we're lucky in that all of our employees can work remote. Um, we don't have any employees that have to be um, on site uh, from that aspect. So, you know, safety aspect, we're lucky there. All our patients are, or all of our employees are at home in their home safe. Um, we were already set up to work remote fairly well. Um, when we set up our office over seven years ago, we made a decision at that point, we're going to do everything cloud-based. Um, we didn't want to have really anything tied to the office. Um, so that's worked really well for us. You know, we use Microsoft Teams as well as our communication tools. And we actually use Zoom in our product. Um, so we also use Zoom quite a bit through meetings. Um, I find it's like my days, I'm back to back. It's like I'm switching between Teams, Zoom, and WebEx. It's like every other meeting, it's like everyone's using our technology, you keep jumping back and forth. I've also found through that in the office, because I'm one of those, I like to be in the office. I like to have the face-to-face. The -face. I think just people being there, you get that knowledge transfer just from passive listening. Um, but I've also learned from this, being at home, it's made myself and others be a lot more deliberate about now interacting with people, reaching out to them. Um, for example, I've set up where every other day now I do a water cooler with all of my my entire team. So. 50 plus people, we all jump on a Zoom meeting every other day for at least 20 minutes just to socialize, just so we don't lose that, you know, personal touch from there. The other aspect for us, though, being in a healthcare software, um, we've had COVID um, really spike our business. You know, so the flip side of this is not only are we work from home, but we're seeing a surge in our business like we haven't seen before. Um, we've actually got hospital systems that are using our product to not only monitor their patients, but they're monitoring all of their employees. So they put their employees on the platform saying, you've got to do this twice a day, report your symptoms to be able to report into work um, so that they can help keep their patients safe, keep their staff safe. And we also have um, first responders, for example, EMR, which is the largest um, ambulance for um, service in the US, they're using the products to monitor all of their first responders through the platform. So through that, um, I would say we've kind of had the extra stress of not just the COVID and being at home, but also the growth of our platform, our infrastructure. So, you know, my team, we're working day and night right now, you know, making sure to stay ahead of the curve of that surge that's coming in. Yeah, absolutely. I can imagine that it's it's a challenge, not only the scale to support your people, but as you're in, in, a, in a line of business and your software is specifically tailored to healthcare, it can be um, double the challenge. Yeah, right? but it's exciting, yeah. yeah. And exciting too. I mean, just um, yesterday we got a, a positive story from some of our customers saying how the software has helped them catch some patients that were declining and you know pull them into the um, hospital and admit them that needed. So it's one of those things here. So it's very rewarding what we're doing as well. So there's a lot of stress, a lot of work, but we always have that good heart feel that you know we are making a difference in you know people's lives, which is a positive. Yeah, absolutely. In the toughest times. Um, so Chris, when you think about um, these challenges from a security point of view, what are you seeing with customers and partners in maybe how they're, um, what are some of your thoughts on recommendations on, on how to support 
remote your, uh, users, remote workforce, right? But what are some of the security considerations that should come into play at the same time? Right. So uh, I, I want to kind of start back where Glenn was at with uh, some of the empathy that we must have for our employees uh, and our customers. Um, so what we're seeing is we're seeing that threat actors didn't automatically get like more capacity. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, security blog from Microsoft about their threat intelligence. So uh, as COVID and, and as we've all dispersed out of the the, the, the physical offices that we've been in, what we're seeing is not more attacks, we're seeing different attacks. Um, it's the same infrastructure, just with different keywords to get us to click. Um, and so what's important, um, and my very first recommendation is, is be sure you have a clear line of communication um, to your teams about COVID and give them the right resources to go to. Uh, these attacks are being more successful uh, because there's a lot of information that our, our employees, our customers want, um, and they're not able to know what is the trusted source. So if you can help guide them either by being a funnel and bringing that data to them or providing them, you know, here are the resources to go to, click here. Uh, and remember, threat actors are using these other emails and these other links to try to get you to uh, open vulnerabilities. Uh, you can help educate while also giving them the assurance that, that they're looking for out of, out of clicking on these things. Uh, so the FBI has shown that we've had a 400% increase in the number of incidents that they've received per day. Um, and I think that's just because of the susceptibility of our uh, home <clears throat> environments um, or our remote environments. Um, but again, the, the tactics are still the same. We're just dropping in more COVID names, coronavirus, uh, IRS, um, stimulus uh, checks, you're right, click here and you'll get this. Uh, so I think that's the most important thing is, is get your communication up there. Um, and from an actual tactical standpoint, vulnerability threat management. So uh, assume that one of one of your endpoints is going to click that link. Um, are you patched to be sure that it doesn't move laterally? Are you are you protecting micro segmentation? So check your patching. Uh, the ransomware, these attacks, uh, these payloads that go off, um, uh, they're not they're not zero days. There are patches out there. So uh, we've always done a pretty good job in our industries to. Uh, protect and patch uh, any data that we classify as privileged. Um, and, and we kind of struggle more on the edge. Uh, so right now is, is, a, is a big push to update your edge and be sure that those are, those are clean um, and patched. So those, are, those would be my two. Yeah, excellent. Do you see that, um, you know, there's obviously you mentioned that the bad guys are just have more uh, information that they're pushing towards people. Uh, maybe from a marketing point of view, right? Adding in COVID and stimulus, like you mentioned. Um, but are you seeing any specific uh, industries that have been targeted or getting more attention than others? Uh, we're seeing healthcare and financial um, are, are both highly targeted um, for uh, obviously the research. Um, a lot of nation states, so a lot of the the spear phishing, the, the the crafted ones, are coming after our healthcare providers and our, and especially the research firms. Uh, the the financial sector for uh, the uh, stimulus checks um, and trying to uh, get consumers to uh, open up their bank accounts while they're at home. Uh, a lot of online banking going on right now. People aren't able to go to brick and mortar stores. Um, a, a lot of benefits are being paid out right now. It's also bonus season right now. So uh, so so financial is always a, a huge target, but those are the two that, that we're feeling right now. Mm. Makes sense. So Matt, with Microsoft, um, what are you seeing as far as um, opportunities where uh, customers can really take advantage of programs or to help manage costs? Um, how have you been able to, to look at opportunities where um, Microsoft can help those customers maintain and manage costs as things change and, and maybe um, enable their people to work differently and more productively? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, probably the last month, I have been on calls almost every hour of every day with our partners, with our customers, talking through uh, business challenges, you know, sending people home, what do we do, how do we do it? And there's an interesting trend, you know, uh, a lot of us that are in more of a, a, a corporate role, uh, we might have a laptop that the company issued us, uh, but for a lot of customers, they don't issue corporate assets. And so they're telling people to go work at home and they might have a personal iPad or maybe a personal computer at home that they can kind of do work on. But um, that it, 
brings a lot of risk to the environment. Uh, you know, now you have people installing free VPN software, you have people installing just any tool, just whatever it takes to get work done, you know, having access to corporate email now on that personal device, so on and so forth. And so we're seeing a couple of things. One, we're seeing uh, these employees at these organizations just going out and purchasing things like free VPN software, purchasing different types of meeting solutions just so they can try to get work done. So you have this shadow IT thing happening. And so that's one area that um, you know is a huge opportunity right now is to figure out what is that shadow IT that's happening inside the organization because it is happening, and how do we mitigate that? Because there's definitely you know money being spent there, and there's also security risk and compliance risk as you start to go down that road. Uh, the other thing is just looking at it from a productivity perspective. Obviously, things like Microsoft Teams and making sure people can be collaborative. You know, like right now we're in a meeting, we're in a, a live webinar, but we still have to go back to our day jobs and get work done. And so, like for me personally, uh, being able to co-author a document inside Teams and collaborate with my peers in this kind of virtual space still allows me to, to be able to get that work done. But most importantly, though, what we're seeing is going back to the example of employees that don't necessarily have a corporate asset and they're being asked to go work at home and just get whatever technology they can find. We're starting to see a rise in Windows Virtual Desktop, and that's the ability to access a, a fully functional uh, you know, computer, if you will, that's hosted in the cloud uh, remotely, and you can access on any device. But the beauty of that and the opportunity there is I don't have to go and procure a, a, uh, a liability such as a laptop, give it to you, and then when you do come back in the office when this thing, if this thing is over, um, then that laptop just sits in the corner gathering dust. With Windows Virtual Desktop, I could easily scale up. I can get my work done. I can access it from any device anywhere. And then as I start to go back in the office and go back to my, my normal routine, we just scale that back down. So there's a lot of opportunities there to explore a little bit more outside the bubble um, on where you can save some costs. And, and really now is kind of the, the right time to do that because of, of what's happening. Yeah, Keith, if I could uh, chime in there just a little bit, that's okay, break the format a little bit. Um, Absolutely. We absolutely are seeing um, customers engage us in conversations around the virtual desktop. Um, one, because they've been forced to to go think about this, but also the technology is there. Um, and so it, it's a good time to to, to kind of hit the reset button on something that maybe they've put off before. Uh, the other thing I think about what Matt's talking about is, okay, it's one thing that I can work from home, but I have these tools teams using them as an using that as an example um, how do we use it <laughs> so um, the big thing we're talking to customers about a lot is uh, the change management aspect and the enablement um, and making sure that the employee understands how to use these these tools effectively um, and quickly um, and then how to use them properly um, and that that could be content that's already um, already readily available to them we, we provide a platform called Empower IQ, which is a change management and uh, learning platform, but we can also allow customers to put their own content in there and also share it out with their employees in the way that they need to digest that. Um, so it could be, you know, messaging like for a line of business, hey, this is how we're using Teams for our, our group and this is what I need you to do and, and this is the process. So the technology is important. The, 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 th the important thing in, along the lines of that is how are you going to enable the user to actually use that technology? Or not just Teams. I'm not used to using O365 in this work from home environment. I don't use all of these applications regularly, but I need to now in this new world. So how do you enable that to happen as well? Yeah, absolutely. So take advantage of what maybe they've already invested in as an organization. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the turn up, you know, turn up the heat on the applications that are there that they just haven't really turned on or put emphasis on with their employees. Um, or you're, you're also, you know, in certain cases, you see there's there's early adopters of certain technology that's available and they've figured out process or they figure out how to use it effectively. Like I'll use our marketing team. I mean, they're big users of Teams, but also the other tools that are around. Uh, teams from Microsoft, and they're very efficient. Um, so they're very comfortable uh, because they also work remotely. Um, all of them do, and they have been. And they have already got this figured out, whereas they're trying to help their peers say, hey, it's okay. Here's the way you address that, and let me share some best practices with you. And here's where you can go to learn more about things on your own to 
make this happen for you and your team. Yeah, absolutely. Chris, how does um, security kind of roll into uh, as organizations look at uh, rolling out, enabling, um, taking advantage of what they already own? Do you see uh, organizations, um, because things have changed in this economy, um, looking at security and trying to cut corners there? What kind of potential risk and impact could that have on a company? Yeah, great question. Um, the, 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 the team that's most impacted by this is gonna be your risk and your compliance teams. Uh, everybody got sent home and we had to immediately shift to remote work. Uh, and uh, what the security teams are responsible for now is understanding what data is passing through those platforms, doing an appropriate risk assessment. And it's just changing the assessments that have been previously done. Uh, so uh, I think one of the questions that, that we were kind of looking at is how has this impacted your security team? Um, and everybody's everybody knows your IT folks, you know, with the provisioning of laptops or assets or virtual desktops and configuring those has been hit. Um, but your GRC folks uh, are also um, having to hit this. Um, your policies, are gonna have to bend, otherwise shadow IT is gonna be there. Uh, our teams are creative, um, and if you haven't enabled, or if you're telling uh, your organizations no, they will find a way to to continue to do shadow IT. So we have to enable, uh, from a security and a compliance perspective, uh, the paths uh, that all of these teams are struggling with uh, in their new normal. Um, so, so that's what we're seeing in security is, is how do we how do we help find secure solutions that fit for everybody? Um, and while the marketing team in Glenn's example is a perfect example, like can we can we spread adoption of that and, and do economy of scale so that security teams are not doing teams for Microsoft and Zoom for your customer advocacy teams? Um, how, how do you be sure that your security team is able to, to have laser focus on the productivity tools you're looking for? Uh, so I think that's a whole lot of the GRC and the security impact of it. Um, the security team, uh, inside your SIM and, and inside your SOC, they're going to pivot their focus a little bit because the attacks are going to swing um, from people coming into your firewalls to uh, people coming in through your VPN. So those are minor changes that your teams will be able to adapt to very quickly. I think it's the policy. I think it's the enablement pieces um, that if, if you're not already in a, a pretty uh, fluid remote working environment, that's probably where you're getting stuck is in your GRC, uh, your compliance programs. Um, you know, can you can you can you post uh, patient information in Teams? Can you post your sensitive financials in Teams? And what happens when that does happen? Right? Have you prepared for what you need to do to to recover from that? Do you know what the policies are? Um, so I, th I think GRC and security on on shifting their focus. Um, is what we have to do. I think uh, another interesting thing of this is exposing to is you think about us as enterprises, you know, we have a lot of this in place. It's it's making some adjustments now that we're going home. But I think of the lessons I've learned over the past few weeks with all of the schools, the education that have had to jump into this model that weren't used to it before. Um, and Zoom being a good example of that too, of how Zoom provided that a free platform for the all of them to jump onto. But it's back to that, do you, not having that enterprise level um, policies in place to set that security in place, we kind of see some of the consequences of that. You know, So you know, my observation was Zoom overall wasn't necessarily an insecure platform, but it comes down to how you configured it. You know, how do you set it up? What are the things you put in place? Um, so I think that's an interesting lesson that probably a lot of people have learned over the past few weeks and be interested to see what comes out of that. I also think it'd be interesting to see what comes out of out of the all the school districts and their IT departments now because they haven't had to do this in the past, but how they have done this, what differences are we going to see coming out of that from an infrastructure security aspect or from a remote aspect? So uh, those are the things that I'm curious to see. Like, what does post COVID look like now after all of this? Yeah, absolutely. you know, it's interesting just to jump in real quick. Uh, so Glenn, you mentioned adoption change management. It's it's interesting when you think about when that new normal does start to come back and people do start to slowly go in the office. Are we going to have this hybrid model of some people are remote, some people in the office? What does change management look like for that? You know, you have Matt Sosman in his home office, and you have you know Glenn and Chris back in the office. How do we bring him in? How do we still enable him to be collaborative in projects and meetings? So, I think that ACM portion of that is really interesting. And then, Michael, I just want to touch on something you mentioned around, um, around the enterprise security of, of these meeting solutions. Absolutely. And what we're starting to see over the past couple of months here is that people are using tools like Teams and they're starting to store a lot of mission critical data in there. 
right? Sensitive chats, sensitive conversations, sensitive files. And um, we really need to make sure that we get a, get a hold of that kind of data and understand, okay, you know, is it secure? Is it protected? Uh, what controls are in place that if you are in a personal computer, can you download it? Can that download be blocked? Auditing all of that. There's a lot to think through there. And so, you know, Keith, kind of going back to your original question around what is the opportunity? Um, I think the opportunity is, is here in front of us to kind of finally get a grasp of this, this, this governance of our data and making sure that, that it is protected and making sure that it could still be free flowing, but just have those, those rails on it to make sure it is, you know, somewhat secure and, and, and compliant. Um, so it is an interesting, you know, story here that's evolving and, you know, it's going to be exciting to see what happens over the next, you know, six months to a year. Yeah, because we have that extra, in my industry, you have in HIPAA, you know, we have to make sure that that personal health information is not flowing through emails or flowing through chats and uh, different solutions like that. So that's definitely a concern of ours. Yeah, we were uh, involved in an opportunity with a large global bank um, who accelerated their, uh, their, their need for leveraging teams uh, across the globe. Uh, but it was declared, look, we're going to, we're going to use Teams for collaboration and some document sharing, but it's not our system of record. So you got to be really clear on, to Matt's point, what are you putting in Teams, and you know what what are the official um, platforms that need to be leveraged to, to meet regulations, um, pop, internal policies, etc. So you have to you have to you know think of, through that, but also declare, hey, Teams is cool. I can share a bunch of stuff, but you don't want to share everything that's uh, you know that that you're. That you're think you should. Um, it's more about just how do I be more effective in a meeting or, or documents that affect the communication. So I guess maybe I'll throw this out for the group. So that, that brings up a good point, right? So there was, you know, a requirement to make a change swiftly, right? So a quick change. How is How have organizations kind of moved quickly but then slowed down to actually take some of these considerations into place and how have you helped them through it i guess so i kind of open it up to everybody yeah I, I, i'll just jump in first um from an external perspective with customers uh, and partners i think the last i'll say six weeks has mm -hmm. been more about just stabilization, get the operations, you know, running as best we can and adjust to change. I don't know if I can specifically answer your question that what what's on the horizon yet. Um, I know they're thinking about it. They're they're just saying, hey, I'm just coming up for air. But um, I, I think a lot will remain to be seen to touch on all of these points, right? How am I secure? What are we what are the policies? How do I, you know, are people able to to adapt to the new new way of life? What other enablement do I need to help help them? Um, oh, by the way, we might go back to work in an office environment that I, it's not going to be the way it was. So, what's the setup, right? To match point, you might have two out of the three in the office. Now, how do you handle that, right? So, I think those are the things we're going to have to be thinking about and addressing. I haven't seen a trend there yet in the sense of what what customers are needing. Um, you know, for the horizon. Outside of, there's still a lot that need, you know, virtual desktop as an example, and they're trying to figure out how, how they go invest in that. Yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of jump in, you know, kind of going back to your question here, uh, Keith. Um, you know, it, it's interesting, a lot of the organizations I'm working with, they're, they're starting to really form their cloud strategy. And by that, I, I don't necessarily mean, yeah, we're going to go and, and deploy this technology. It's how are we going to use the cloud to help our business survive? How are we going to use the cloud to help us make our employees more productive? How are we going to use the cloud to adapt to this changing market condition? And so we're starting to see some, some of these governance boards and these organizations being formed on, all right, we need to kind of think differently now, given the situation and how, maybe not necessarily survival, maybe in some cases, but more of how do we take advantage of the technology to continue to let us to do business with our customers? So we're starting to see that, and that has some downstream effects around security, around compliance, but also around just productivity and around um, you know, different things like that. So here's a good example is Teams, obviously using that internally to stay productive, but now you start to think about Teams live events and doing webinars with your customers. Um, and how do, you, you know, how do you do these virtual events? So there's a lot of interesting, um, interesting ideas that are uh, coming about in these governance committees. 
And they're really starting to look at how do we you know, leverage the power of the cloud to help us adapt to the market and continue to survive, continue to you know, bring in healthy revenue and then help service our customers. So it's, it's changing from an internal IT type of thing to now uh, this is now becoming critical to our core business, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So Chris, how, how have you kind of, or what's your view on, on these points, these topics? <laughs> yeah, so um, what we're seeing is with our existing customer base, we're seeing actual explosions um, in our healthcare customers and our educational uh, platform uh, customers. Uh, so we're seeing rapid growth. How do we fit in with security and DevOps? How do we allow them to scale um, and still provide them the same security outcomes, uh, single pane of glass so that they can view all of their assets and, and, and keep a handle on the security as they grow? Um, and then the, the second piece of that is, is that for customers that aren't already with Armor, we're seeing uh, a lot of questions come in, uh, inbound uh, calls saying, hey, uh, my cloud strategy migration is about to kick off. Uh, I have to be here. Um, and uh, you, uh, how can you help me? Um, and then we start having those conversations about security where uh, in, in Azure, in AWS, on-prem, um, and, and we start helping them understand, you know, where's your data at? How do we protect it? How do we give you the outcomes? Um, and how do we get how do we get you there quickly uh, to, to help protect these things that are that are spinning up? What do you think has been the light bulb moment for them, Chris? Uh, it forced remote work. Um, so I, I refer to it as the great disbursement. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of security folk uh, are like, we like our walls. We like to know that you plugged into port number forty three, and therefore, uh, so so kind of the antithesis of zero trust, um, and, and that's their comfort zone. Uh, and so they're like, yeah, I'll consider virtual desktops. I'll consider remote work. We'll punch holes one day. Uh, you know, two factor off for everybody, MFA for everyone. We'll consider all those down the road. But right now I got to focus on you know this one policy I'm working on um, and it was it was pretty much a light bulb moment when they're like well nobody comes in the office anymore um, and I have to make this work today uh, so all of those things that were you know kicking the can down the road uh, all those things came back to them and the the executives said go right you have to mm-hmm. you cannot block us you have to enable us but we have to do this securely so all of those strategies you have to do today I think that was a light bulb moment for a lot of them is like how do I get to the cloud how do I get there yesterday um, now how how am I going to do the security and how am I going to pre- prepare for uh, maintaining this uh, so that's that's the the thread that we continue to see is no one's talking about everybody go home and then in June we're all going to come back and okay VPNs are back down uh, everybody check back in your laptops and no more virtual desktops. Everybody's talking about this is our new way of work. Uh, we have to be prepared for this. Um, you know, if it comes back in the winter, if something else happens, right? No one wants to be caught with this again and answer to your board. Um, so you've got to be prepared to handle this today um, uh, and, and have those security uh, policies uh, and technologies in place to monitor and, and, and keep your, your business functioning but safe. Yeah, I was going to add too. I appreciate everything Chris is doing because we are all of our stuff is hosted in Armor, so I appreciate all of that. Uh, what we <laughs> observe too is we all of our new customers that are coming on right now, you know, being in healthcare, they're still doing all of their due diligence on security. Um, you know, so the difference we see is not that they're not doing it or they're relaxing it, but we see that they're putting more emphasis on it now. So it's like where before they would make take a few weeks to do the security review because you're just trying to set up meetings and get the right people in the room. Everyone now is, sees the urgency, and so all the right people are in the meeting at the right time, so you can actually be more efficient and do them faster at this point. Um, so we've seen that work really well for us. Good point. In your space, uh, in the healthcare space, do you see, um, you know, uh, the data, certain compliance, HIPAA compliance regulations? Is it access for? Uh, data in general, or is it employee access to the information that they're now putting more urgency and security thought around that for their users uh, maintaining the data? Yeah, it, a lot of it, it's maintaining the data and obviously the data in transit, um, but I mean, they're really still focused on the patient's data, um, which as I mentioned earlier though, but now it's not just the patients, it's their employees that are in the system too. So their employees have become patients as well. So they're all, their data is all there. So it's still that same focus on, you know, is that data being stored in a secure place? Is it being, whenever it's in transit, is it secure? Um, 
from our corporate office, like I said, we were already kind of set up this way. So we had all of those in place, we already had the VPNs and the security in that aspect. Um, the other thing we've seen is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, having Zoom built into our product, you know, and again, I, I give kudos to Zoom for what they've done, uh, but they've got a lot of press and a lot of negative press. And so that negative press also led to a lot of people asking us, well, how are you handling this? How, you know, what are what, um, I was vivifying managing the issues that Zoom were having. So we've seen a large influx of those types of requests. Um, so, and from our aspect too, is like, as I'm sure, as long as you take an enterprise approach and secure it from an enterprise aspect, it's perfectly fine. You know, a lot of the things you hear out there aren't real issues within Zoom when it's being managed from an enterprise standpoint, which we've been doing for over six years. Absolutely. So this has been, um been great dialogue matt um you know are there any items that you kind of want to touch on um uh, we're kind of rolling up to you know the q a portion so to take a few minutes but before we do are there any any thoughts that you have on you brought up before that future state what's you know um post covid look like i know for me it's back to terminal b at you know, Boston Logan International Airport, right? But what do you think that looks like for most organizations that um, aren't enabled to be remote workers by nature or, you know, somebody like myself that is mobile and has been working from home for 16 years? Yeah, that's a, that's a really, that's a good question. It's kind of a loaded question in a way that, um, you know, we don't know, but, for me, when I kind of look into my crystal ball and, and kind of agreeing with, with what Chris said, um, remote work is, it's here to stay. And and it's people, they, they were thrown into this where they may have never worked from home before, but it's really forced organizations to take this seriously. I'm, you know, for years we've had, I mean, I've been a remote worker for almost 10 years, but for years, you know, you go to a company, even back in my consulting days, and their culture was just not working from home. It was, you had to be in the office, that's fine but now they're forced to work from home. And so now they're starting to adapt the technology and, and really start to think about, yeah, can I use something like Teams? Can I do online meetings? Can I be more collaborative and, and all that and use the technology at their disposal? So in this new future, you know, you mentioned, you know, being in the airport, even if you are traveling, you know, now that maybe your organization has adopted more remote work type technology, you can stay productive using something like Teams or Windows Virtual Desktop or native technology while you're in terminal B at the airport. You know, versus a manager in the office might be more, more um, conscious now of allowing their direct employee to work from home. So if they have a sick child or they just don't feel like coming to the office that day, it's not going to be quite stand office as it used to be. It's going to be, yeah, actually, you know, stay home. We've got the technology in place to allow you to do that. And um, so I, I think we're going to see a lot of that. Uh, I also think we're going to start to see a rise on security. Um, just, you know, again, the last you know, month or two that I've been talking to customers and our partners, uh, they're really taking a good hard look at security, but most importantly, they're looking at what kind of data do I have? How do I protect that data? How do I manage my endpoints? Um, it's starting to, to turn into something that's being taken a lot seriously than it has in the past. So I think we're just going to continue to see this evolution and this, this growth. Um, I don't think the future. I don't, I don't think any of us can predict, predict the future, but what I do know is that I think they're going to be more perceptive to technology now and more open to, okay, how do we let technology help us in our business, whether we're at home or in the office, whereas yesterday it may have been a little different, right? So that's kind of how I think about it. Um, and I'm, I'm just kind of curious, Chris, Glenn, Michael, you know, do you agree, disagree with that? Any, any thoughts there? I know my team's already been asking me, it's like, now that we're all working from home, we prove it works, so are we going to stay this way? After this, yeah, it's yeah, um, go ahead, go ahead, Chris. I was just going to echo that, uh, that I, uh, Matt, I wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I'm, the remote technology is here, um, uh, the security around it, the, the learnings that every organization has gone through, uh, is going to put them in a place where they can continue this on. And I think HR is going to take a hard look at it and say, we need to enable this, uh, for our, uh, for our employees, uh, and I think employees are going to start actually asking for this as part of their terms of working there. Like part of your culture is, can this, how did you do this? Um, and what are my options going down the road? Um, so, so I think it's, it's 
critical to it. And, and I do believe that it has brought a lot of security into uh, the conversation um, and it brought the right people in the room, uh, back to Michael's point, uh, that we're engaging with the right people uh, regarding the security policies, um, technologies and platforms that are being used and, and implemented today. Yeah, I, I, look, I I think everything's going to be challenged uh, if it's not already, right? Because um, someone, we're all looking for some state of normalcy, but we don't know what that is, right? And um, so everything I think will be looked at, scrutinized, as well as um, how does it allow them to leapfrog past these current challenges we have, right? So cloud, security, innovation, productivity, uh, there are certain roles like how do you work from home? Right. And do I have the right tools to monitor productivity when they've been very used to monitoring uh, and, and inspecting activity in a work environment? Right. And uh, now it's what are they doing? Are they are they doing the laundry? And that's on the on leadership's mind because they're not used to it. Right. So you got to change your management system. Uh, you got to change the tools you use. Um, you got to change your expectations. Uh, so I think I think everything related to this is going to have um, a different set of eyes on it and a different level of expectations, um, which will be fun, but will be challenging uh, for us all, right? Um, and, and there's certainly some people that are gonna have to uh, change the behaviors along the way too. And that, that, that's not meant for anybody. It's, it means everybody's gonna have to you know, change their behavior on, on how they move through this. Absolutely. How a manager interacts with an employee, how an employee interacts with a peer, how a team interacts with one another, right? I mean, all of these things are going to evolve. Without a doubt, um, things will change. I, uh, not to put you on the spot, but um, I know that for us at Crayon, we have a, a very specific approach to onboarding new hires, right? Take us through, Glenn. Um, how that's changed because we are actually onboarding a couple of new hires during this yeah. uh, remote from work and stay at home initiative. Yeah, yeah. Historically, uh, we, we pull our new hires into to the Dallas office and it's a three day training and, and immerse, immersion into the company and the culture and the DNA and, and what we do. Um, so obviously that changed. Uh, so actually, we just kicked off um, our first new hire class since COVID events uh, began and uh, it was remote on Teams. Um, we broke it up into chunks and we make make, sh make sure that the agenda kind of fits a, a remote environment. Uh, so the jury's out on the, the effectiveness, but I think so far it's working well, but um, it's it, people accept it too, right? They understand that it's different. They don't know it's different. I know it's different, but they know that, that a training environment via Teams is different. So, um, you know, we're gonna, we're going to learn a lot through a, a remote new hire onboarding session. And we're similar that we've actually, we've had about five people start during this and we still have more people starting over the next few weeks. So it's a, now we have to drop ship on a laptop and then it's all done virtually through teams and those types of tools to onboard them. Yeah. And, and real quick, if I can interject, one of the things we were working on prior to even with a, on-site training was, you know, a lot of docu more documentation on training, centralization of the training material. Uh, so when we did update it, it was centralized. Marketing's done a great job helping us with that. And um, actually that allowed us to jump right in to this remote setting because it's like all the documents were there. Um, and now we just, we feed, you know, we push them to that central point, um, which, which allowed us to be much more effective um, in, in how we approach this. Yeah, excellent. So um, let's open up to the audience, see if there are any questions. Um, so please, if you have uh, questions for the panelists, please uh, use the chat function, the questions function in uh, the webinar here. And let's see if um, we have any questions. I don't see any questions. I see a couple of people have made some comments that they standardize on Teams, which is great. I'm sure Matt's happy to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kudos, right? Yeah. Well, 
it looks like uh, there are not any uh, any additional questions, so we can uh, kind of wrap things up. I think in in closing, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for attending the webinar today. Would love to uh, thank the panelists for joining us and making time out of your busy schedules. So Michael, Glenn, Chris, and Matt, thank you very much for bringing uh, great thought leadership, your experiences during uh, these challenging times uh, to the group here. And it was thank great you. to hear your, um, your thoughts on how companies are scaling their workforce through these challenging times, how organizations are maintaining and managing security standards, and also, you know, looking at how they can um, manage the costs and the budgets that are associated with these changes. Hey Keith, I think we yep. have a couple questions that have come in. We have like oh. um, a few of them. Great, could you take us through those questions? I'm not seeing them in for sure. whatever. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Absol absolutely. The first question that we've had come in is, are you finding that many organizations are super network security centric and therefore at a much greater risk than those with the cloud strategy? Yeah, I, I could take that, and I would love to kind of get Chris's thoughts on this. Um, you know, so what I'm what I'm seeing is it's it's kind of half and half. Um, a lot of them are very network centric. You know, we got to have the VPN, we got to have the firewall, we got to have, you know, these network appliances. Um, and then we start to see people going home, and the conversation is shifting to like a zero trust strategy, specifically with identity. And we're finding that identity is not up to snuff, right? Identity is not um, properly you know, design and configure things like multi-factor authentication and single sign-on and making sure that um, somebody's monitoring the identity for, you know, credential abuse and that kind of thing. So we're, we're kind of seeing half and half, but, but it's interesting though, because, you know, a lot of their legacy line of business apps are still running on premises. They're not in the cloud. And so having VPN access and trying to provide secure remote access to those apps uh, is opening up a lot of doors. But, you know, Chris, I'd love to get your thoughts here on what you're seeing. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what we are seeing is is uh, those that have not yet made the jump to the cloud, and and this is their first foray into it, um, they are coming from a network-centric uh, position where they've dropped appliances in to kind of look at network traffic, um, and they've kind of shied away from workload protections. Um, and so, so they're not comfortable yet with with uh, native uh, cloud, uh, bringing in those log sources to to get security outcomes from those, uh, or you know bringing your WAF back to uh, to the actual web servers themselves uh, with like uh, Signal Sciences or, or AWS WAF, uh, so that you can actually get to the inside of the encryption. Uh, so those that that have not been on this journey uh, that are just now starting it, we do see that. Uh, those that have been, you know, working on their transition to the cloud or battling, uh, you know, uh, perfect forward secrecy for a while, uh, they've already been kind of retreating to host-based tools or application layer tools uh, or cloud native tools, depending upon, uh, you know, where they can get their data. Uh, so we are kind of seeing the, the NIDs kind of moonlight or, or network telemetry kind of moonlight um, uh, in favor of cloud native uh, tooling and uh, host-based tooling. Perfect. So the next question actually is for you, Chris. It says, how is remote workforce balanced with PCI, HIPAA, and PII compliance, where requirements like video recorded entrances, access to workstations, and other data security cannot be monitored at every employee location without being too invasive? Right. So uh, great question. This is, this is going back to... Uh, uh, kind of my statements earlier where I said, you know, the, the number one organization that everybody knows got impacted was your IT force. Uh, secondarily, it's, it's your compliance, it's your GRC programs. Uh, so it's it's user education on what platforms they're allowed to use and what they're allowed to, to do on those platforms uh, and also providing them compliant um, and trusted tools um, for for those types of, of data tra transit and, and to be stored into. Um, so it's a lot of user education uh, because those platforms already existed. Um, nobody's implementing a, a new uh, uh, HIPAA data store uh, due to COVID. Uh, what they're doing is they're changing the ac access methods to those, um, and they need to be sure that they're educating those that are using that to be sure that they're following the, the guided uh, practice that the uh, the auditors uh, are, are going to want to see, uh, being sure that all of that's documented, monitored, uh, and uh, if there are any gaps remediated. Next question 
is what are some tools and resources you recommend for a company to adapt to for a successful work from home environment, such as the Windows virtual desktop that you guys mentioned earlier, but what are some other tools and resources that you would recommend? Microsoft Teams? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, we, we found that O365 and, and Teams specifically, we were well, we, we were fortunate and, and we were prepared. Um, so I would absolutely explore those platforms. Um, and then, I, I, like I said earlier, make sure you've got some form of, of change management view to that. You can't just roll tools out and just go. <laughs> um, it, it just doesn't work um, or it'll fail miserably. So you make sure, I'd make sure you got, have that view to it. And we're a software development company, so we leverage things like Bitbucket, Jira, so we're already using cloud-based tools so that we could all work remotely from that aspect. I'll, I'll echo that uh, for for us. I've seen a huge uptick in projects that have been able to be migrated into Jira, um, and that's from software development to product management to project management, scheduling. Uh, Find a collaboration suite that uh, you have economies of scale on. Uh, again, you know, a different tool for every team is going to be pretty hard to manage. So um, if you can find one suite, um, stick with it. Jira appears to be working for us pretty well. Yeah, I'll echo that with, with what Chris said. I mean, you know, find something that works for you and that you can standardize on um, and, and wrap security compliance and governance around it. Uh, you know, I mean, for us, obviously Teams, uh, but, you know, I talked about Windows Virtual Desktop, but, you know, to Glenn's point, just Office 365, there's a lot of capability in that suite that can help end users just be more productive, whether it's, you know, OneDrive and storing your files or it's using something like Planner or Tasks. So um, lots of different tools out there. Just the problem becomes, you know, picking something that you can standardize on and something that works for everybody, uh, which is definitely going to vary based on who you are and what you do. Do you guys see any liabilities for organizations allowing BYOD, especially from like a legal or cyber insurance perspective? I, I can jump in here a little bit. I, I, um, I, I just had this conversation with a, a, a customer. They were a law firm. It was a couple of weeks ago. And the, the consensus was, um, you know, they absolutely felt that there could be a risk there. Um, and so that's where the conversation started to shift towards other technologies like Windows Virtual Desktop or some kind of RDS type technology. Um, I think it's going to depend on who you are and, and how you view that risk and you know, what your legal counsel might, uh, might, might recommend or, or how they interpret it. Um, but with BYOD, it, does, it brings a lot of positives. Um, but with the negatives, a lot of that we can kind of mitigate, right? There's technologies like in tune with autopilot to manage those devices. Um, there's technologies where we, like my, my personal iPhone here, uh, the company does not manage it, but they manage the app. So if I access the Outlook app with my corporate email, they could control that app, but they have no control over the device. So it's leveraging those different types of technologies to figure out you know, where you want to draw that line. Uh, BYOD can absolutely work. You just got to you know, make sure that you have that security strategy around it. Um, and then, you know, most importantly, I would say is being able to manage that at scale, right? So how do you do that across the entire organization, uh, regardless of your size? And that could certainly be a challenge in monitoring for that. Uh, that's a great question. I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on that. But. I want to jump in. Um, I, I think every device uh, that comes into uh, your environment is a risk. So BYOD is definitely presenting new risks and new challenges. Um, it's up to your risk appetite on on whether or not uh, your security controls and the way that you've segmented your network, uh, your maturity and zero trust uh, on on whether or not BYOD is an acceptable risk um, to enable all of the, the pros that come with that. Um, there, there's a whole lot of really positive things with, with uh, bring your own device, comfort, uh, mobility, um, just a whole lot. Um, and it can all be mitigated with with the right technology strategy, with the right processes in place, and your policies can be made to to make that work. Um, it, it, it really, the, the, the biggest hurdle I've ever seen in that is, is legal saying, no, we're not going to accept that risk. Um, and, and so even conversations with them, they, they can accept that risk. It's just a matter of whether or not they, they want to or not. Excellent. So Rachel, I don't know if we covered all of the questions from the attendees. 
Yes, that, that about covers them. We have a few more and any that are unanswered, we will be sending out email responses. So have no fear, we will, we will get you guys um, answered questions. Excellent, that sounds fantastic. Appreciate your help there. A little bit technology challenge for this webinar platform. So I appreciate you covering the questions. Uh, but for the attendees, um, thank you very much again uh, to our panelists and to the attendees. Thank you for making um, your time uh, to be with us today. Don't forget, take the uh, exit survey as you leave the webinar. So thank you very much to everybody. Um, and I hope you have a great day. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone.